Wednesday. Good afternoon, everyone. We can start uh, the final part of this event. This is a short session, which includes only one presentation and followed by the panel discussion. The presentation is still on Hermambi project and uh, the focus is on fast running models developed at, at the University of Sheffield. So, thank you, Lorenzo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. So, good afternoon, everyone. So, I'm Ling Wai He from the University of Sheffield, and we will present our fast running analysis models for the Masonry Arch projects. So, first, some discussion about the structure, and first, I will introduce some background information about this, uh, this work. Then, my colleague Nicola would introduce all the technical details, including some uh, numerical examples. OK, so background. So for the fast running tools, we are looking at like, several tools with different focus. So at the moment, we got three types. First type is the well-known rigid block analysis. And the second type is the physics engine, which allows you to do simulation quite rapidly. And third type is a novel discontinuity layout optimization method it developed. So first, uh, rigid block analysis, and we know that the methods are simple, so there are various methods available for us. And one of the problems of this method is, of course, it requires very detailed geometry. And also because of that, the results might be a bit sensitive to some local changes of the uh, geometry. And also the, um, the solutions might identify some local failure modes. So if you want to get the overall behavior of the bridge, and this might cause some problems. And of course, we can uh, include some various block block interaction rules. So here we got, I assume most of you know, the uh, limit state ring. And at the moment, we are developing the limit state ring 3D, which allows like 3D structures to be modeled and also including some more complicated like pro roles such as crashing and also we developed a parametric modeling workflow for us to do parametric studies using like standard rigid block analysis tools and the second category is physics engine so we are developing a web-based like uh, physics engine to simulate the uh, collapsing behavior of uh, square or skew bridges and of course, it's based on like physics and it's not running all these complicated um, simulations. So it's fast. So normally you can simulate the process in seconds or minutes. And we made it a web app. So there's zero configuration. So you only need internet and a smartphone to use it. And we also made the tool interactive, which means you can post the web app and you can also make some changes to geometry and to mimic some um, phenomena you see in practice. And also try to make the tool a bit like versatile. So at the moment we got only one like feature, which is to like uh, adjust the uh, direction and orientation of the um, abutment blocks. So so you can see some um, sort of settlement movement effect to see how the structure will behave. And of course, this engine got its problems, and it's at the moment only you're getting a qualitative result, so you're not getting the accurate load factor. And at the moment, we're only monitoring the uh, the masonry elements. There's no soil, unfortunately. And the third category is the discontinuity layout optimization, and this is a like novel numerical process to identify the uh, load carrying capacity of various structures. So this method is very reliable because we use uh, rigorous mathematics. So this ensures highly accurate solutions. And because it's using mathematics, the process is also very efficient. So we, for example, in our other like yellow applications, we can solve problems with more than one uh, 10 million variables on more than laptops. And also the uh, the method itself is open source, and we have recently published uh, like Python scripts for everyone. And of course, the method is very versatile, and we have used it 
in various applications. I can you, you can see from this picture we actually uh, try to use the method to solve uh, different problems, and there is of course an issue, and that is we need to make some more developments in order to use it to analyze mainstream arch bridges. So our solution is to use um, homogenized DLO. I think the uh, concept about homogenization has been mentioned multiple times in this workshop, and make it simple. So basically, you find a repetitive pattern on your block, then you sort of work out the um, equivalent material and make it a homogenized material. Then you can solve the problem as a continuum problem using well-established numerical methods. So, so this has several advantages. For example, um, we can model potentially complicated failure criteria. Basically, it depends on what behavior we want to include in this uh, small homogenized material. And of course, since we don't have uh, like local blocks, then we actually avoid like local failure modes. So we actually looking at system failure modes. And of course, this will be insensitive to more geometrical variations. So from my personal experience, when using rigid block analysis, if you have some small errors of the model, then you get local failure modes. So this method will prevent that from happening. And also, lastly, the, the method actually assumes that the blocks are infinitely small and aspired ratio matters. So this will give us um, conservative results. So use these methods to, uh, to solve mainstream arch problems. We actually have two approaches. So the first is a relatively simple approach. So we sort of um, discretize our domain and make it linear approximation. So because uh, the planar DLL problems has been like studied very extensively by us, so we got confidence that it will work. And of course, when you have this technique, you can model relatively complex geometries without difficulties. And also because of this uh, piecewise approximation, we, there is a potential that the solutions are less accurate. And the second approach aims to solve this problem by using parametric geometry representation. So using this method, we have a smooth curved like uh, geometry, so we get accurate geometry representation. And for that reason, that is the potential that we get much better solutions than the uh, approximated version. Of course, we got some problems because um, using that, we will need to solve some quite challenging mathematical problems. And also because this is a new method, then of course it needs um, further validation. And uh, we'll stop here and pass this to my colleague, Nicola, to discuss all the uh, technical details about this method. OK, thank you. Thank you, Lingue, for the introduction. So what I will uh, present you now is uh, some details about the formulation uh, focusing on the second approach for the application of the DLO about on uh, Mensory Arc bridges. But before moving to that, I need to just introduce some details about how DLO works, at least for a um, simple problem. So here we have, for instance, a simple out-of-plane loaded mensory panels. How is it applied, DLO, in the standard scheme? So first of all, we discretize the problem by defining some nodes. We interconnect the nodes, identifying a layout of possible discontinuities, each one representing a potential, a potential failure line, a potential yield line, in this case, for the problem. And then by solving a simple optimization problem, we can define, we can identify the critical yield line pattern and the load factor associated. So this is uh, the optimization problem used to solve the, pre the previous DLO scheme. Uh, we won't enter in detail about the quantities included in the problem, but this is to say that it is a simple linear programming problem obtained by applying the principle of virtual work under the constraints of compatibility, flow rule, unit, unitary live load work, and non-negative plastic multipliers. So the advantages are, are that, of course, this is a simple linear programming problem, so nowadays can be solved in a very fast and efficient way, even if the number of unknowns is high. And also applied to DLO, it allow defining, um, it allow representing 
failure modes in a very accurate way. This example is just to show you that we already applied this DLO scheme to a simple situation, simple but inspired from real existing cases. So this is, for instance, a measure facade inspired to um, UK typical facade uh, subject to out of plane loading. But of course, uh, in the context of DLO applied to measure arc bridges, here we have some drawbacks. So first of all, in this method, the actual measure texture is not considered. And secondly, uh, this method is applied only to planar, situ to planar cases, to planar geometries. So in order to move to uh, the case of mesoriac arc bridges, we need, first of all, to include homogenization to take into account the real um, mesory texture. And secondly, we need to introduce the parametric geometry in order to move to curved to curved geometries, to, to curved shapes. Okay, so the first key concept is the homogenization that has been already introduced by my colleague Ling Wei. So basically, in order to apply the theory of, of homogenization, we need to define a homogeneous material that is equivalent to the heterogeneous material, in which the heterogeneous material is the mesory texture composed of rigid blocks. The idea is to apply the discontinuity layout optimization to the homogeneous material. So in this case, the DLO is, co it is called homogenized DLO. And in order to be applied, we need to have to evaluate the equivalent energy dissipation between the two models, heterogeneous and homogeneous. The homogenized DLO must be able to represent all the potential, the potential failure modes. And finally, the flow rule should be satisfied along all the discontinuities. This is that to show you how homogenization is applied. Of course, there are strong mathematical steps included in this procedure that are not presented here. But the idea is to identify a repetitive pattern that is called uh, reference, um, reference volume element, RVE. And at the reference volume element level, we um, identify the microscopic variables that basically are the strains, the curvatures, and the rotations. And by using these microscopic variables, we can evaluate the energy with reference to the microscopic variables and to derive the constant related to the imposition of the flow rule. A homogenized DLO method was uh, already uh, developed for the case of in-plane loaded mesory buildings. This was a recent application at the University of Sheffield in which uh, homogenized DLO has been applied to several geometries, in some cases also quite uh, uh, complex. But again, this remains in plane loaded cases. And so in order to move to the mesoid arc bridges, we need to introduce the parametric geometry. In particular, we need to introduce uh, the use of parametric surfaces. So the rigorous uh, definition of a parametric surface is uh, the mathematical one. But basically, the idea is having a three-dimensional curved surface in the three-dimensional space that is uh, that correspond with a mathematical function to a two-dimensional parametric domain. Of course, uh, this uh, uh, function can be written manually in the code, but the idea will be to have a communication with the modeling software, such as Rhinoceros, in which uh, parametric geometry is uh, typically adopted. The idea about how to apply DLO in these cases is to define the nodes and the initial layout in the parametric domain, and automatically, the mapping function allows to obtain a three-dimensional curved layout on the curved surface. There are just some points to be mentioned about the, um, the case of the curved discontinuities of the curved uh, possible yield lines. First of all, to uh, assure that the flow rule is satisfied along the wall yield line, we need to define some collocation points, collocation, collocation points that basically are used to evaluate if the flow rule is satisfied or not within the problem. Also, the local axis defined along any one of these collocation points, automatically identify the texture orientation. In particular, we can notice in this picture that the yellow axis corresponds to the direction of the bed joints. So for square arches, there are no problems in this case, but for instance, in the case of skew arches, we have to pay attention because if we do not apply any rotation to the local axis, we will obtain a corresponding uh, wrong texture. We will obtain, for instance, the face skew texture. Whereas in the case of the actual skew texture, we need to rotate the axis in order to have a correct representation of the failures within the homogenized material. 
So in, uh, I will present you in a short way the final optimization problem. So this is the optimization problem associated to homogenized DLO applied to the parametric geometries. Um, basically, in this case, we have that all the matrices included are taking into account uh, the curved geometries. And also we have the two new quantities that are the flow rule application and the energy equivalence. So we have an energy vector that represents the energy equivalence between the homogeneous material and the heterogeneous material. This is a simple workflow about how this formulation is applied. And it is just to show you that basically the input information uh, needed to apply this method are very low, okay, very few input information. So basically we need a geometry that, as we said, can be also imported from modeling software, lower the material properties and nodal density. Then the flow rule and the computation of the parametric surfaces are automatically done within the um, pre-processing and processing part. And finally, the final output will be the collapse load and the definition of the critical real line pattern. So as also Lingway told you, the method is still under validation. We are still going on with this work. Uh, so we will present you now some first results about that. The, this is the square measure yards tested by our colleagues, uh, Colin and Serena, and show it to you this morning. Uh, in this case, we basically considered a line lower, so expecting, as a matter of fact, a two-dimensional result for the measure yard bridges, for the measure yard bridge. The, on the left side, we have the result obtained by rigid block limit analysis, whereas on the right side, we have the results obtained by applying the homogenized DLO. Uh, the result is depicted by considering a solid model and um, underlying with red lines the openings in the model. The model is uh, also viewed in transparent mode, so we have to pay attention about which lines are at the exodus and which lines are at the intrados, denoting the opening at the exodus and at the intrados. But we can notice here that there is a good correspondence because the red line just corresponds to the opening of the cracks within the rigid block, uh, the rigid block model. Anyway, more interesting is the case in which we apply instead of a line load, a point load on the edge of the skew arch. So again, on the left, we have uh, the results obtained by considering rigid blocks in which we can notice that similarly to the experimental uh, to the experimental test, we have the collapse of just one side of the bridge, showing somehow a three-dimensional, uh, showing a three-dimensional effect in the collapse, whereas the other side of the bridge remains undamaged. And uh, here we have the result obtained via homogenized DLO, in which also we can notice that we have a concentration of the openings on one side of the bridge, even in this case. And somehow the inclination of the um, inclined cracks are matching the cracks that we can notice in the rigid block modeling. So I will move now to the conclusions. So we presented the efficiency of three fast uh, running tools that are the rigid block limit analysis, the physics engine, and the discontinuity layout optimization. Then in particular, we showed how the discontinuity layout optimization can be applied to the case of mesoid arc bridges by introducing the concept of homogenization and the parametric geometry. And in general, that seems to be a good match between the results obtained via rigid blocks and the one associated to homogenized DLO in presence of parametric geometries. I think, uh, see you some time. Okay, I think that that's, that's all. So. Thank you, Lingwei and Nicola. Very interesting presentation. We are really on time. So we have time for questions. Uh, we've still got one more activity, which because we've got some time, then ah, I want to prevent well, this um, web app so I can show how it works. The other one. <laughs> after conclusions. <laughs> OK. So you can uh, assess the web app by logging to this uh, Amavi website, and there's a News, your web app available, and there's a link. Yeah, so by default, you have this uh, very simple structure, and this is a bit boring, so I won't solve that. So we can assume, like, something I'm quite proud of is to make some changes to geometry. For example, uh, you can like, move this apartment 
a little bit and yeah, and see what happens. So you can uh, sort of simulate something like that, and of course you can stop it. And yeah, if you think oh, this, this block is like blown away, and uh, <laughs> of course the, the bridge will fall down. All right. And another another feature I didn't actually explain in my slide is you can uh, actually uh, get the share world link, and you can if you save the link, then you can share it with your colleagues, and it will reproduce this bridge in that particular configuration. Okay, I think that's all. Okay. <laughs> Questions? Okay. Questions from the talks? Hey, Michelle V. Um, so the DLO, I gather, was previously applied to slabs. Mm -hmm. And what you've got there is essentially a curved slab with some complicated materials. Um, will it will it adapt to the normal real case of bridges with very stiff backing? So that you don't have a thin slab beyond about the third point, it gets progressively uh, thicker. Yeah, at the moment, I think one of the assumptions of the current DLO is you have a thin wall shell. So if you got very steep backing, maybe that's not. But may, maybe that's another way to model the um, the backings. But that's of course a research question. I can't answer now. Okay. Other questions? I was going to ask, uh, why did you need to specify the uh, the uh, angles of the texture? Because I thought failure could happen in all sorts of directions. Um, uh, yes, failure can happen in all directions, but the material property depends on the angle of your texture. So, okay, so. Thank you. Um, when you were looking at the edge case, you were showing quite different results between the rigid block and your DLO um, analysis in terms of capacity, but in terms of behaviour the same. Do you, do you know why that is and which is more accurate? Or... This one. So one thing I can I can say first, and I will leave the question to Nicola, is uh, the DLO will get the um, the actual lower bound, so more conservative results. So we will get a, a lower collapsing load. But uh, about other questions about the, uh, the pattern and other things, Nicola, maybe you can. Uh... Well, thank you, Lin Wei. Now the only detail I can add is that, uh, as also Lin Wei told at the beginning, is that uh, the hypothesis behind the DLO behind the DLO formulation we are using is that uh, DLO is implicitly considering an infinite number of blocks. So in order to check if even with the rigid, uh, rigid block model, we can obtain exactly the same capacity associated to the homogenized DLO, we should model, uh, we should realize a rigid block model in which uh, the number of bricks is uh, much higher. Okay, cannot be infinite, but ideally much higher. And we should notice if there is somehow a convergence between the two results in this case. But this is also why we are we sustain that homogenous DFO should provide in any case conservative results in comparison in comparison with the rigid box limit analysis models. This one, yeah. Because in, in this case it's just find a two-dimensional mechanism for the arts and it will be quite similar even with higher number of blocks. Maybe the position of the cylindrical hints can be a bit different in the longitudinal direction, but substantially the mechanism is that one. The three-dimensional case is much more critical in that sense. Okay, so we in this case, there's no interlocking, so you get this standard 
like failure mechanism, but once you have 3D behavior or skill bridge, you got interlocking fat, then the solutions will be different. And you know, because you are ignoring, sort of ignoring the size of the blocks, you're assuming only the uh, sort of the pattern or the aspect, where you show how you assemble the bridge. So only that will affect the solution. So you'll get different, hopefully on the safer side, hopefully that. No more questions, so we can then terminate here. Thank you again. The final part of the event uh, includes a panel discussion. The topic is key future research challenges. So, right, thanks, Lorenzo. Uh, so I just invite to invite the the panelists to step down and uh, join me on the stage. So uh, as you can see, we have uh, Ivo Sinan and uh, Hamish Harvey uh, from Bill Harvey Associates who hasn't uh, spoken uh, yet, but we'll be speaking now. So uh, similar to yesterday's panel discussion, I just want to kick things off by just allowing each of the panel members to say a few words about themselves, particularly those who haven't introduced themselves already. So perhaps uh, uh, Hamish, for those people who don't know you, say a few words about um, your background in this field and then a few words about uh, what you see as the key future research challenges. And then uh, we'll, we'll, we'll wander through the, the, the other participants and then uh, open it up to the floor. Thank you, Matthew. So I think most of you worked out that I'm Hamish Harvey so far, but um, I have recently inherited two companies from my, my father, who was previously a sort of national expert on masonry bridges. Um, one named after him, Bill Harvey Associates, is a consultancy um, where we deal with difficult problems with masonry bridges, essentially. Um, We've also, in that context, developed photogrammetric survey as a diagnostic tool um, and, and do a fair bit of R&D either <coughs> on, on pro things that might become products or for other parties. And then there's a separate company, Obvis, which supplies and supports the RGM bridge assessment software. So one of the one of the tools that's quite widely used in industry. And that provides a sort of unusual perspective in that I spend a lot of time looking at real bridges and serious pathology in bridges and also dealing with support questions. How can we model this? How can we represent that? Um, uh, and uh, so I'd, I'd say in passing that, that re research isn't necessarily the big barrier to improving our ability to care for masonry bridges. Um, it is a barrier, but the, the, the biggest barrier is developing a cadre of engineers who understand masonry behavior and have the forensic approach that's necessary for dealing with individual cases because none of that is taught in university people graduate and drop into the drop into the industry and assessment and don't have any of those skills and that's a real serious problem that said um the the most important observation as far as research is concerned, I think, is that while most bridges are very capable of carrying the real loads that they are subjected to without collapse, many bridges are by inspection not able to carry loads assessed as within capacity without suffering cumulative damage. Um, it merges slowly, it gets worse over time. Many but not all, that's crucial, and we have no way of predicting which ones suffer damage and which ones don't under service loads. So I think the fun, my, from my perspective, the fundamental challenge is to produce models, plural probably, um, that are given data that are practically and economically obtainable diagnostic of damage generating mechanisms. So we can actually assess and decide whether loads are likely to cause damage under particular conditions. Um, and given that, I, it's the future research question. I'd really like to see a, a, a shift of attention from ultimate behavior much more towards detailed interrogation, interrogation of service load behavior. And in concrete terms, that might involve a program of parametric studies like those that we've been seeing, um, teasing out the influence of those bridge features, but particularly focusing on what's happening at service load. 
Um, and there's a real desperate need for a, a big program of field measurement, of actually measuring the behavior of real structures under real loads, lots of different structures, different geometry, different internal features. I'm uh, Ivo Calio. I'm from Catania in Sicily, in Italy. I teach at the university. I teach dynamic structures with application to earthquake engineering. And uh, about 20 years ago, I was involved in modeling uh, Mesori. And so initially, we proposed a simplified method, method for modeling Mesori structures. Then, as you saw in the presentation, we moved from Mesori to Mesori bridges. Then we started to cooperate with some office, railway offices in Sicily, in Italy, in Milan, indeed. And uh, we started to promote some simple tools for assessing the, the Mesori bridge in, in, its, in, in its actual condition. Now, as a, a further open issue from the railway office there, they are asking to, to develop some tools for modeling possible reinforcement strategies. Because one real problem is not only to assess the, the bridge, but, but also to establish if the bridge can be retrofitted or is better to demolish it and to rebuild another bridge. And so we are trying to improve the, the simplified modeling approach for introducing easily the possibility to, to choose several retrofitting layouts using both traditional and innovative materials. Regarding an open issue, I was involved in bridge collapse, measuring bridge collapse, in which we discovered after, after some uh, modeling survey in situ tests that the 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 bridge collapsed for creep phenomena. We don't uh, speak about creep, so slow deformation in uh, many years in a uh, measured bridge. But if the bridge has a very tall piers, and uh, if the piers is not homogeneous, the creep phenomenon can produce uh, a redistribution of load from the internal part to the external or from the external to the internal and can activate instability and the collapse of the of the pier. And so I think there are some parts that can still be explored in, uh, in the context of the modeling and uh, should be considered particularly for particular type of bridge in which the, the piers are very tall. So I think it's a very complicated uh, modeling measure bridge is a very complicated issue as, uh, as we saw. So it's important to use both simplified then detailed modeling, but the engineering judgment is fundamental because in my opinion, no model can uh, uh, model the, the real, the actual behavior in, uh, in a precise manner. Thank you. I've um, introduced myself earlier. My name is Sinan Chikoso. I'm an associate professor at the University of Oxford. Um, I got into masonry arch bridges through measurements, uh, through conducting field measurements, and uh, I was quickly struck by how limited measurements have become compared to um, to what you can get out of simulations. Um, and um, you know, seeing all this wonderful insight that you can gain from from simulations that we've seen from the range of tools today, I think. Um, as engineers, as structural engineers, our challenge is to really um, get measurements to the level uh, that that simulations are um, to deliver the answers that 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 uh, that we that we need them to deliver. Um, and I find that that requires a, um, a level of technical engagements um, that's you know maybe some sometimes uncomfortable for us. Certainly for me, uncomfortable because uh, techniques are different. They're not uh, what we have studied at university. They are. Uh, uh, they have different uh, sort of ways of looking at the problem. So I think uh, that I see as a challenge for, for, for engineers. Um, and I think uh, 
materials, knowing uh, what what the materials are, no, knowing uh, you know how they behave, what uh, is, is is also quite important. Um, you know, Ivo mentioned creep. There was a discussion earlier of fatigue, um, and uh, picking parameters for these is is very very difficult. And uh, when we do uh, tests in the laboratory, we often don't have any clue. Even we we, we saw a range. For instance, of the test that that uh, the very comprehensive test that that Mercedes did, and the, it, it's incredible that the amount of data that we can gather from those series of tests, but still, stuff that we care about that relates to cracking parameters are still very very difficult to get. Um, so, I think that's that's also a challenge for us to to uh, 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 to overcome. Thank you. Um, yeah. You're not tired of listening to me uh, this last day or two. Uh, I'm Matthew Gilbert. Uh, my um, interactions with Mestrach really started uh, a bit over 30 years ago when I was doing PhD work, uh, particularly focusing on large scale testing of mystery bridges. I think you saw some of those in, um, in, in one of the presentations earlier today. And then in order to try and make sense of what I was seeing in the lab, um, went into the analysis domain rigid block analysis amongst other things um, and it's also led to the ring software um, about 20 years ago uh, now managed by uh, a university spin-out company limit state um, i've obviously with my academic hat on i've been involved in lots of research projects over the years i've always tried to have a, a, a foot in in the, in the industrial camp as i've normally got uh, one or more um, active projects on involving uh, some thorny problem um that, that that's been felt uh, by industry colleagues somewhere around the uh the uk or overseas um in terms of challenges now one way of trying to identify challenges is, is to not look at the problems that we've got now is to actually go forward in time go to 2050 or something like that and, and, and imagine what it is that we would like you know how, how we would like to look after our bridges in 2050 and that's actually something that we we put to members of the MRB steering group at the first meeting. I think it was back in um, what, in 2019 at Imperial College, wasn't it? We had a workshop, uh, Lorenzo, and we and we basically uh, did some brainstorming. And what what came out of that is basically we would like our bridges to to let us know when they're suffering. Um, uh, and um, how how on earth we're going to achieve that? Well, Effectively, it boils down to um, a, a, a live assessment, effectively a, a digital twin. So effectively, you have a bridge or a series of bridges on, an, on a line, a uh, population of bridges, um, and they can be talking to each other because they might, might have bridges of similar construction that might have similar issues affecting them at similar times. They are effectively um, perhaps in, uh, instrumented with some sensors. Um, uh, a few, uh, sensors need to be in the in the right place on the plaster of the bridges of sensors so actually working out where the sensors should be is a challenge working at what sensors are going to give us information that's going to be useful um having it all uh wired up so to speak um such that actually we can have a live assessment where um only when a, a, a structure is actually um um in need of uh, external intervention, um, it, it actually uh, popping up on some dashboard, on some web browser, uh, is it, certainly a challenge. Uh, this maybe maybe feels like um, um, ambitious, but I think many of the te techniques that, that that would be necessary to do that uh, are already there. Certainly, in other fields, aerospace, for example, classic thing with Rolls Royce air engines, a couple of sensors. Uh, has absolutely revolutionised their, their their business model and and the way they manage their aero engines. Um, lots of work to do. Maybe, maybe uh, the, the series of challenges required to achieve that outcome is something that we we collectively uh, could focus on. So that's uh, um, some suggestions uh, as as to what might be the challenges. I think particularly um, in this session, perhaps it didn't happen. Uh, as much as perhaps we would have liked at the at the first session, uh, we'd really like to um, have the participants here who've got a huge amount of know-how experience, not just to talk to the panel, but also talk amongst uh, 
uh, talk, talk with each other. So um, I'm going to open up to the floor initially um, um, to, 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 to answer that question yourself. What, what, what challenges that are different to what, what you've heard um, would you say are the pressing needs? And I'm, I'm particularly thinking of, of slightly more fast, you know, um, far out challenges rather than I've got a particular problem with a particular bridge. I need to solve it next week. So that's the f my opening gambit. If you just want to, uh, um, any 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 starters on that on that front? Yeah. Hi there. Uh, so I I work in structural health monitoring, and so Matthew, in in response to the comment you've just just given about. Um, putting structural health monitoring on a lot of structures and then telling us when there's a problem. I think in large case, the technology is available. It's about picking the right parts for masonry arch bridges and choosing them uh, appropriate to those structures and then defining what is good and what is bad and, and looking at where those boundaries are. And I think that's probably a really good space for a lot of research to be applied. And I can see Hamish edging to respond. A name for it. <laughs> Indeed. I mean, is there any progress in that kind of field? It's probably it. Is, is there progress in that field? Is that, it, I mean, it, it's certainly uh, um, an area where lots of people are working on little components which would add up to it. I mean, we've seen some today um, and um, I think the, the, one of the problems is that to be um, to be really useful, there's quite a lot of things that have got to come together. Um, we're not talking about um, you know, a simple homogenous population. We're not talking about you know a series of um, identical products that have come out of production line. We're talking about you know much more heterogeneous population and. Uh, until such time is is it's 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 reached a, a level of development, it, it probably doesn't have a huge amount of value, I would say. But clearly, we we need to do work to get there. And I guess that good back to Hamish seems to be saying is that needs investment. I mean, in terms of the um, in Marby project, deliberately um, we. We, we we kept away from data. So Sina talked about data. We felt, um, unlike many other structural forms, we need a base level of understanding um, using basic physics to get there uh, before we start um, just 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 throwing black boxes, or grey boxes, you know, various other colours of boxes are available. Um, however, I think those boxes of different colours, grey boxes and so forth, do do definitely have um, a, a role in 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 the future. I don't know if that quite answers your point or not, but yeah. Uh, just maybe very briefly to say, I think uh, I, I, from a research point of view, what I see much more value in is is uh, measuring much more rather than a few sensors because uh, in masonry you never know where failure is going to come um, and I think now the techniques are getting there to be able to do that um, the, the the I completely agree with uh, interpretation side of things I feel um, this is one of the reasons that I really struggled when I first started monitoring projects with no understanding of um, of masonry arch bridges the meaning of data wasn't quite clear. We can measure strains, but you know what does that mean? Um, all of these measurements, displacements, what does that mean? All of this needs to be put into context, and I think models play a huge role in that. And getting that link to be a robust link, uh, so we can use models to understand more about data, uh, is I think going to be an interesting uh, challenge. I don't know if my colleagues want to say anything. I can just. <clears throat> Add the comment because in Italy, after uh, the Morandi bridge collapses, collapsed, uh, they started to monitor a lot of bridges. And uh, the real problem is that uh, 
many companies started to receive this data, but they don't know how to use them. So the real problem is uh, which data are needed for mon monitoring massive bridges. For example, if you use frequencies and uh, we use frequencies for other bridge, the frequencies can and the more shape can be useful to calibrate a linear model, but we are not interested to the linear contest. We, we want to assess the capacity of the bridge. So it's, uh, in my opinion, it's an, an open issue. How to monitor, the, how to monitor a Masuri bridge? What, what is needed? Are the frequency real important to monitor? Could be important for, moni for calibrating a model in the linear contest, but not for assessing the bridge. And uh, as Sinan said, probably it's better to have much more data and to compare the, the data in a long-term condition to, to obtain some useful information. I, uh, I have some doubts about the potential of systematic instrumentation of masonry bridges. There are a lot of them. As Sinan points out, you need to measure everywhere to have any hope of actually picking up a particular defect or emerging. Um, you can come back on that. Um, and and it, it belongs in a, in, a, in a family of approaches that I, I think are all sort of pushing to remove engineers' eyes from structures when what we actually want is to come up with ways of efficiently getting those experienced eyes onto the structures because engineers can look at 100 structures in a day if they're given the right tools to do it and pick out the two that matter. And no instrumentation on the 98 would have been of any value in that context. I, I just, just come back on on, on Sina's re remark that we need hundreds of cents in every, every bridge. I mean, in, interestingly, the um, the, the uh, early um, air engines, it, it, the, the Rolls-Royce, um, were instrumenting, I, from recollection, there was either two or three sensors per engine, and I think there was three measurements, so three numbers, um, when the, the plane took off, once when it was uh, cruising, and once when it was landing. So it's so nine numbers, basically, and that was enough to give them an indication as to what the health is. Now, in a masonry bridge, um, I'm not saying that you can you can directly um, uh, um, um, correlate with an air engine, but you think of how complicated an air engine is, and the number of moving parts and, uh, and all the rest of it. And what I would say is um, something the work we've, we've we've been referred to yesterday is permissible limit state, where you're you're starting. If you go above your permissible limit state, the idea is that you're going above. Um, mobilizing the primary modes of resistance and actually there are lots and lots of indicators um, on a bridge that, that if, 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 if load um, loading is an issue there's lots of indicators lots of symptoms and uh, you don't necessarily you don't need sensors to measure indications of 50 of those symptoms you, you just need to, to to do the research to work out what what are the uh, are the key indicators that would be would be useful. So I wouldn't be thinking of, of of more than a very small number of sensors if this if this approach was was to be was to be widely used. And in relation to we need more more eyes on bridges. I think the key thing is we need more eyes on problematic bridges and, and less time wasted going on. Bridges going to look at bridges which are absolutely fine and have got no. Um, I'm not saying we don't ever look at them, but we, um, you know, th there's no point in doing a routine assessment and just seeing, um, uh, you know, nothing for the, you know, the, the, the third or fourth time in, in, in a particular duration of time. So that's my, my own personal perspective. But uh, um, do, 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 do you want to come, come, come back on, on that scene or should we open it to? I think with the Sylvanus is yeah. yeah, I think I was going to say, so I think we were waiting. Thank um, So, Daniele Fornelli, um, Geotechnical Observations. Um, I work in the same space, I think, as Dave. Um, uh, I think the fact that panelists disagree on this probably symptom that maybe there's more research 
needed, as they was suggesting um, about you know the use of data. Um, and I think I mean data has been mentioned I think hundred times in the last uh, half an hour. But I think they've made a very good point. Um, data are well. Let's put it this way. I haven't seen yet anyone pointing me at the tree of good data. Um, I think someone, uh, I think Hamish was before um, mentioning about, you know, uh, building skills for assessment. Um, getting good data is a skill in itself. Um, and I have the impression, but maybe you know, the audience and maybe the panelists will disagree, hopefully not, that there's not enough being done in that sense, I think. Uh, not at university level, not at other levels as well. Getting good data is not easy. It's actually quite complicated, not only on structures, but for your techniques as well. Um, so, and I think we have a cultural problem in that sense because data are not necessarily at the center of much of what we do uh, in terms of university courses. And this will become a problem the same way it's a problem for assessment it is a problem for the industry as well. So I'm not asking you for a solution now, but I think there's something we do need to think about collectively. If we want to use data, we need to have the skills to gather, well, first of all, to design proper monitoring systems, if you want, and then to gather the right data. Otherwise, all of this is underpinned from the start. Yeah, it's a, so how to specify systems, also how to frame questions and, and you know, what it is that you're trying to measure. You can't just monitor a structure. You need to monitor for something. Um, you need to have a question that you're trying to answer before you start designing the system. But yeah, that, that whole whole area that tied in with the forensic work that I was talking about, that how you how you go about iteratively. You, you need a dialogue with the structure to work out. Once you have it, once you know that there's a problem, there's a back and forth that involves data and thinking and models to come to a conclusion about what actually might be wrong and, and then what you can do about it. I can I can briefly say that I, I, having spent quite a lot of time trying to attach something to masonry surfaces and seeing how slip is a major problem. Uh, that of course data collection is is very difficult that requires quite a lot of work in the lab laboratory and there's a lot of engineering work that goes beyond I think research that you know, to find the right glue, you need to find the right interfaces when you when you do measurements. Uh, I think that's good. Good data is 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 hard to come by. Um, I I find that, for instance, the data that's been collected for for uh, for practical purposes is not good data for research as well. Uh, that's another sort of point because the density is, is as I mentioned before. I think we need higher densities to be able to understand more from from the fields. Um, I think that 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 aspect isn't there. Uh, I would also say there is uh, th th this is a bit, bit of a bugbear, I guess, uh, that I have. But I feel like in civil engineering, we uh, have traditionally separated ourselves into experimentalists versus numer uh, numerical people, and that distinction does not particularly make sense. Uh, and I think to to overcome this this uh, the, the challenges that we have, I think that distinction needs to close. That you know people who are people need to be confident with numerical modeling as well as gathering that data, and understanding that data. That needs to go in hand in hand. I agree with that. Just, just going back to the point, I'm, the disagreement, perhaps it wasn't a disagreement we've, we've seen on, on reflection. From a research context, absolutely we need hundreds of gauges, hundreds of sensors on, on our bridges. I, I guess what I was thinking of is in 2050, when you know we actually um, we find key key areas we won't need 150 gauges once once we have the understanding. To get the understanding, it's a bit like um, I think after Lorenzo had given his talk yesterday, there was a question saying, you know, yeah, it's going to be too, too expensive for us all to be doing level three. We, no, we, 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 that wasn't the the um, um, suggestion that everyone's doing level three. We need to do level three as researchers to get the understanding, and so we need hundreds of sensors on our bridges, as as Vasilis showed in 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 the Leeds uh, uh, full scale test that he he he, he, he showed, because at this stage. Uh, we don't have enough understanding to know what it is that we care about. But in due course, hopefully we will uh, understand better what we care about and hence we'll be able to be much more focused and and hopefully it will it will drive down the cost and make 
make this kind of technology, this sort of vision actually realizable. Okay, um, this was a point over there, yeah. Hi, Sam. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, yeah sort of following on from the SHM type angle, uh, and you'll talk about um, assessment in the future. And I'm personally in the long term, I'm thinking that it's sort of changing the focus of assessment. So rather than just putting numbers into software to get a number out of its capacity, it's put it changing the engineer's focus more on the understanding of behavior and at what point that structure is past its um, permissible limit state. So it's looking for those crack patterns, it's looking for those deformations. And if we can better understand at what point it's starting to struggle visually from because we've got that data, that assessment that tells us what the symptoms are going to be, then that will help us focus where to put that structural health monitoring. So if we know that particular structure, that's where we're likely to see maybe the first significant cracking, then that's the way we can target. Um, so I would have thought it's almost pushing towards 3D and the FE, and it's really good to see a lot of examples of it being looked into. And I, my experience of it's been really positive of seeing 3D FE done um, because it just gives you so in, so much information on where the cracks are likely to occur and how it's behaving. And I think that's more useful than like the ultimate capacity. Mm -hmm. So I, as a challenge, I think maybe one of the future goals actually is move away from like the level one, level two, level three almost because if, if we've got the computing power, just go straight to level three because the expense is actually in the inspection and the access and actually the analysis should be a relatively small part of it and personally in the assessments probably only 20 percent of the answer anyway if the key is actually looking at the, the structure and understanding how it's working i'll just pick that up first i mean i, I think um moving away from an assessment for a given structure once every 10 years or however many years uh, it, it is definitely the way um, forward. However, um, I, I would I would disagree with uh, the suggestion that, that that level three is the way to go every time. And I'm actually thinking I've been in this area for long enough to know that um, complicated models were always just a couple of years away, and that's that's been for the last thirty something years. Um, I think things get you know going back to permissible limit state if you're mobilizing primary modes of response the response of a masonry bridge is pretty simple if you're if you you're running hot sam you, you're basically you're running all your structures well above permissible limit state then you're going to get all sorts of complicated modes of response which will require a level three assessment to unpick but what i would suggest is that it'd be more um effective and economic in the long term actually to run your structures less less hot to run them below the permissible limit state um and and then you don't need to go to the level of um of that level three because so many of those detailed aspects of response which level three tools do it is effectively what i would say unreliable secondary expander walls and so forth um you know once you need to mobilise those, you need to mobilise passive soil pressures, all the rest of it. Then, then you're you're, you're on that slippery slope. But I, I fully fully agree with the the point about moving away from the ULS, um, moving to a permissible limit state. Um, it is is certainly something that that uh, I, I obviously would would would, would second. Anyway, I'll pass it on to others to comment. Comment. I, I agree that it's uh, needed. Uh, a three-dimensional model for assess, uh, uh, for fully assess uh, measure building, but you need also data. You need some uh, in situ test. You have to ca calibrate also the measure. Otherwise, it may be not useful to use a very sophisticated model if you don't uh, have data. So you need uh, to to think about what uh, in situ tests are needed to identify the, the measure characteristics because although almost all the measure bridges in the UK are brick measure, but the 
strength of, of the masonry can be different, so the damage hidden can be different. So it, it is only also important to have data. Uh, so if you don't have uh, the material characteristic, it may be better to use a simplified model for having an idea, a conserv conservative idea of uh, the assessment, the real behavior of, of your bridge. So, uh, okay, I would, I would say that if we're if we're reduced to identifying that we've passed the permissible limit state by observing the damage in the bridge, that's where we are now. Um, it's clearly not where we want to be. We want to be able to identify the that we're getting close to it and stop before we get there, or acknowledge that we have to do something to the bridge or to accept that it's going to suffer damage and we're going to replace it at some point. But we need to be able to make that decision on the basis of knowing in advance rather than that the damage has emerged. Okay. Uh, I'm involved in design and remedial works for structures, for instance, saddling. Uh, and in some cases, there's some quite substantial saddling in terms of thickness. Um, just looking at the question in the research challenges. Um, how do you see the research affecting best practice such as that which is put forward in Syria C656 or 565? Yeah. Um, and therefore educating a new generation of engineers in understanding that negative behave, behavior changes due to say the strength, this kind of strengthening. I mean, I think that the point was raised um, in, the, in the discussion yesterday that um, actually more carefully uh, scrutinising the uh, the recommended repair techniques in the network rail catalogue would, would would be would be worth a worthwhile uh, field of research. And I'm not aware. I mean, actually, I, I'm thinking actually probably 30 years ago there was a, a, a um, research carried out from the University of Nottingham carried out research looking at the uh, effects of um, various different interventions. Uh, I, I, I'm not, obviously the, the world's moved on since then and, and uh, it certainly didn't go into the level of detail. I don't think that, that we could do today, I, I probably, probably need to. Um, I'm not aware of, a, of, the, of detailed work that's been carried out, for example, to look at some of those network rail details. Um, in, in terms of uh, things like um, saddles, um, again, I'm not I'm not aware of a huge amount of um, you know laboratory work, for example, that's been 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 done to look look at that. But we we did at the University of Salford look at the effects of near surface strong stiff layers or over slabbing type um, approach and found absolutely huge benefits in terms of the capacity and. Personally, I would recommend that as opposed to saddling because it doesn't require to um, to dig down. But, but but I think the reality is there's a huge range of avenues of research and there's a limited capability, both in terms of um, the number of interested researchers and the available um, pots of money to do that uh, that research, I guess. Yes, yeah, that's a great application of the complex models, I would say, that rather than trying to apply them to a real bridge where you have no possibility of knowing the distributed material properties through the structure, being able to explore the impact of those interventions on a range of different structures and see where they work and where they don't. And But I would say that most of the problems, if you're, if you're dealing with live load driven problems, they're problems at service load, not at ultimate. Hi there, uh, Colin Freeburn. I'm in a renewals team at Network Rail, but I'm not going to ask about that. It's not a research challenge, but um, we've had a, a few people yesterday were asking about how do we ensure that we can get you know competent assessment engineers. Um, Hamish, you mentioned kind of ensuring that our engineers are competent to understand what our structures are telling us. Um, we've got three members of the panel that are in an academic context. So I guess, do you guys have any ideas about how we can change the university culture so that we're not so focused on design and we are actually focusing a lot more on maintenance because from where i'm sitting that's where a huge portion of the industry already is and it's only going to increase as the climate emergency 
as we, we, we're waking up to the climate emergency, how can we, yeah, basically prepare our undergraduates to enter a world where they will not be designing the next great thing, but they will be safeguarding and maintaining what we already have, not just masonry structures. This is a bit more general, but yeah. Do you guys have any ideas on that? I, I, I have a probably slightly skewed angle on this because um, the university where I'm at, Oxford University, is a mixed engineering degree and we almost don't teach any design at all, which sometimes we hear people complaining because our students don't know how to draw pending moment diagrams. Um, but uh, I guess the, the sort of flip side of that is that the, 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 that I think that that kind of education where you actually uh, focus more on um, you know, preparing uh, people technically uh, for 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 the job, I think, is 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 quite valuable. Um, I personally, I th I think uh, I don't have the industry perspective, but I feel that uh, you know engineers should should be uh, you know they should be able to access, should be able to address different types of challenges and not be scared of getting into you know this field because that's that's that, that's not their field, that's not their sort of major focus. So I feel that that's that's something that I feel works really well with the with the current system um that 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 we've got of course there are things that you know we don't teach anything about assessments and i don't have a clear idea about how that could be done but uh you know maybe my colleagues might might be able to comment on that from a university of sheffield uh, perspective we we are building in um modules primarily at later years um on um, I'm trying to think of the, of the title of the, of the module that I'm going to be teaching on in about a month's time. I can't remember. It's, it's rehabilitation, some, you know, it's, it's rehabilitation of structures or something, something, something like that. Uh, and I, I get the opportunity to to feed in something about masonry bridges. But um, having previously done an awful lot more on that and having it pushed out of the curriculum on the basis of what um, the regulatory body wanted to do at the time um i it feels a bit like a sort of pendulum swing all over the place so the regulation of civil engineering degrees in the uk is carried out by the institution of civil engineers the institution of structural engineers and another various other um institutions i think it'd be very very well would it be would it be good they, they each time they come they have a, a different bugbear and we end up pivoting in a particular direction but i think certainly it's it's inarguable that we need to be focusing, as Sinan says, on on principles. But then instead of having examples of application as principles exclusively in the design context, we want to have it increasingly primarily in an assessment or a forensic engineering con context, as, as um, Hamish has, has suggested. Um, I mean, we would like to think that we're we're educating our students and not training them, so they're adaptable. But yeah, I think they're you know, after a while, you know, the subconscious bias, you know, hits in, and and people are always thinking of design, whereas it'd be, it'd be much more balanced if they were they were thinking of getting more more of existing structures and rehabilitation and repurposing and all that sort of stuff. I would I would quite like um, students to graduate having learnt doubt rather than certainty. I would add the second point. We have spoken about data collection. Data collection, I mean, it's important, it's needed. Without data, we can't do anything. But what about thinking of regulation of those data, saving them? Who needs to have those data? We have a lot of companies who are taking data thousands of times after four years again because no one has the idea where are those kind of data where who was the company the company has no data the authority has no data and we are retaking those kind of data so before not as a challenge as a research in general but we need to think of as well where we can have those data and where we can put them or in which way we do it i i could just maybe briefly say when uh, people have tried to do this, I guess, in the context of BIM and BIM for uh, new builds, especially, uh, or BIM for renovations as well. But uh, often the, uh, the, the the not being specifically in this field, but you know, data structures and how they they told to be for. But I think the the comments I've heard is cost too much to store. Uh, 
and uh, I, I don't know what to think of that. I feel it's a missed opportunity, um, but I, I, I cannot be a judge of the of the cost. I mean, Hamish, you're getting more data. I guess you can sort of comment on possibly on that. Also, it's just point of view. It's not really as well as the uh the storage problem i think there is um i think there was at a bridges conference when somebody from the uh, um defense establishment um turned up and 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 said that bin models were you know the worst thing uh, uh ever because uh if you, you give a bin model of a building to an electrician and then suddenly the terrorism potential is huge. So I think there are there are security issues. There are also, I think, attending a, a rail innovation conference. I was aware of it's, it's having I trying to have a discussion with about five pe people from different institutions. Everybody had a different commercial incentive not to share their bit of data, and I, and it is a nightmare. It's, it's above my pay grade as to how to solve it, unfortunately. But I, I think you've got a good point. So yeah, I, I was uh, I put my hand up for the previous subject, so I'll go back to that. Um, yeah, it was um, about uh, assessments and, and short of assessment engineers. I mean, when I was a graduate, I wasn't introduced to assessments until about five years in. Um, but at the time, there was plenty of courses for assessments and design. But there appears at the moment be nothing available. So you know, I suppose assessment it becomes a specialism which you go to because you've got some work to do. Um, so I don't know if uh, academia can help on that because it's probably more something that um, consultants used to run or the likes of Thomas Telford. So I think that's that's the, the problem in the industry at the moment. There's no courses for graduates to to, to learn those skills. I, as it happens, I put together a day course which I've delivered to Warwickshire Council recently and I'd be very happy to deliver it to anyone else who's interested. Just a question on the the whole project. We've heard a lot the last couple of days about the building the lab, the the scale models in the labs, and building the the FE models to validate those, um, or rather using the lab models to validate the computer models, and how this level three works going to feed down into um, the level one type modelling. Let's say, what what sort of time scales? How how is this level three work going to feed down into the level one type models that us day to day engineers need to use. What are the timescales for that? Is it next year? Is it in five years time? Is it going to be new codified rules? Cause someone mentioned yesterday about having variable effective widths depending on certain parameters for spandrel walls. How is that going to be? Is that going to be codified? Is it going to come through in Syria guides? What is the intention of this project in how it's going to be filtered down to us? Um, right back at, at you. How would you how would you want it? Uh, um, how would I want it? How, how would how how would you want it um, delivered to you? Um, um, a set of guidelines um, and parameters based on this research that can be used in in simple plane strain, rigid block analysis, or equilibrium analysis, another RGM ring, whatever. Um, that can deal with more complex problems, the 3D problems that using, applying, yeah. So using simple techniques for complex problems based on this research. So yeah, a set of parameters or guidelines or codified rules um, would be great. And in terms of delivery mechanism, do you have any uh, thoughts on? Well, that's up to the Highways Agency and Network Rail, isn't it? I mean, is it going to be proper codified rules or saw Syria guidelines and that's that's not not my decision yeah but it, 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 it's it's not it's not my decision either so um you know, I'm a, a key part of the Amabi project and what we what we're, we're doing now is we, we're trying to finalize um the last phase of the work that's that's going to lead to out, outcomes in terms of scientific outcomes it's then a, a series of conversations we have with people in the steering committee of the Amawi project, but also with with others in um, National Highways, Network Rail, and others. And um, I've been in. Well, this is this isn't going to uh, be very 
good news for you. I finished a project in 2003. Um, a British standard written that project came out last year. OK, so I mean, that, 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 that for various reasons, there's lots of reasons why, why there were delays. And but in that case, we didn't have any budget in the original project for, for dissemination. And spent five years um, effectively trying to get um, support, I think, through the UK Bridges Board and various um, other, other bodies uh, um, to, to actually sponsor some guidance and that guidance ended up getting picked up and then embedded in this this new British standard. So it can take a while, hopefully not not 19 years. Ring covering D, what's the start time scales on that? Um, again, that's um, the prototype version that's in, in development. It's um, it's not it's not my decision as to as to whether um, that ends up being um, developed as a commercial product by Limit State, but we will have a, a or Limit State will have a prototype version uh, um, to, to try. Hopefully, within within the, within the next twelve months. But I mean, part partly depends on the outcomes of 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 the research. In what percentage of cases is, is a is a full three D analysis of the sort that can be done using rigid block method um, going to be worthwhile, or is it? If it's very niche, then then maybe it's not it's not worth um, producing. On the other hand, the converse may be true. So. Five to three, so we have to well, carry on. I mean, we should close at three, four to five. It's not three, yeah. At three, okay, good. So, and yeah, just to say, I think it's great to have limit state as a researcher yeah. to be able to sort of play with. I think so. I, um, I appreciate this sort of extra effort that goes towards having a front end that people can then play with. So, uh, just to say, I think that's that's I'm fully supportive that that happens from a research point of view. I was thinking maybe just adding to what you were saying there. Um, I know that there's been a consultation with the highway authorities recently about increasing loads on bridges to 50 tonnes. And I think we, we've answered that that's due to do with fuel shortage. If it happened, can they fill them properly and with diesel? Um, but there's also a discussion about changing the high high load network. And the fact that we'll need to build far more power stations, wind farms, and everything else. So that and most of these will be off county roads, so they will most likely have arches. So I'm wondering if in the next five to ten years there will be a new assessment program to increase the loading over bridges, because I think there is quite a push from the haulage industry to increase the 50 ton vehicles. I think your knowledge, you're you're more well connected to, to, to me on on that front. So I think you, you, you can answer that question. Um, and we, we've we've seen in the past um, um, decisions taken in in ignorance of the consequences um, having consequences. So you know, the, the classic thing is um, you know, Hamish's father was, was involved in 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 looking at the aftermath of, of, of bringing uh, long wheelbase freight wagons um, down the rail network in the northwest of England, southern Scotland. And um, yeah, that, 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 that caused, um, you know, significant problems and, and ended up, um, I think the outcome was um, an increase in the, in the levy for freight. Now, we don't want to be putting le more levies on freight. We want to be, we, we want to be, you know, Doing the opposite, but that means we have to be a bit more joined up about this thing. So, uh, to be honest, I'll be perfectly honest. That's the first I've heard of fifty ton. At, in terms of the configuration of axles, um, what, I, I don't know what that involves. What the axle loads for these fifty ton vehicles? I, I don't know any of that information. But clearly, it'd be, it'd be useful for this community, given as we've see, heard yesterday, almost half the spans in in the UK are masonry, to know a little bit about things of with these sort of consequences. 
there's, if there's a, a last burning question, if not, we will uh, we will probably ah there is one. <laughs> so uh, I'm just trying to think from the perspective of uh, structural engineers and practitioners. Uh, it seems for me, and you you can either agree on that, that the weakest place in this kind of bridges is the interface between the spandrel wall and the barrel arch, and even in the full scale tests done by leads, this happened like less than 50% of the ultimate loads. So I, I'm trying to think as a structural designer now in the office, if we could consider these spandrels as just non-structural elements as a light load, non-uniform light loads on the outer wings of the, of the barrel, and then also consider the soil as just a weight over the arch, then we will end up with a, like barrel arch with apartments or like the approaches or whatever, then we will reduce a lot the computational cost required to run high fidelity models. And it would be easier even for practitioners to just use something like shell elements, even if, if, if it could be like sexual or whatever. And then maybe the correlation between the high fidelity simplified models and the, the practical models could be easier. And we will reduce the number of parameters and number of complications because by any way, this, this is pandrel walls they fail or disintegrate or whatever. They deattach very, very early from the, the main structure. I'm not sure if this could be worthy to be investigated or it has been already done. So I think it, this is kind of what I was referring to earlier when I was talking about primary and secondary modes of resistance. I would, I would argue that, that the spandrel walls are a secondary mode of resistance. If you want to model how they interact in a detailed way, you need a a uh, high fidelity model I mean, and mo particularly modeling a quasi brittle propagation of cracks at the interface between the barrel and the and the arch however if you're only wanting to mobilize the primary modes of resistance then um you, you don't need to worry about it in 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 the way that i've i, I suggested i'm just um hamish do you want to burning say something or should we are we able to close it It may be primary, so the, 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 but they're the first mode of resistance. So the, 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 they stop the barrel moving, and it's only when it cracks that the barrel is the primary, the, truly the primary mode of resistance. And then it's the interaction between the two that progresses the W. They only require, they only become required to be mobilised um, when you're ex in excess of the um, missile limit state. Is what I would, I would, I would argue. But but you don't get the um, and anyway, we we could probably we could probably carry on for uh, another uh, two days of of of, uh, of discussion. I think um, I'm just going to uh, move us move us move us on because we are just about to hit the uh, the magic three o'clock. Um, I think uh, just just uh, I'll just deal this section from you, uh, Lorenzo. If that's okay, I, I mean I think just draw this discussion to a close i think the discussions have been really really uh useful parts of this this two days um particularly uh the uh, the one yesterday when i wasn't uh, in the hot seat um ho hopefully everybody has um has heard something interesting either from one of the talks or just as importantly in the in the coffee break or lunch or dinner um outside of these these more formal sessions um and uh, hopefully you, you've, you've um, um, come away with a positive experience. However, if you haven't, uh, this is uh, similar to the photographs I've been instructed by my uh, my uh, my colleagues that uh, we would like you to just uh, feedback your um, your comments, um, and that will also inform if and when we we run a similar event in the future. So things that you've liked and don't like, uh, please feed us back. So thanks for coming. Uh, thanks latterly to the, my fellow panellists for, for putting themselves in the hot seat for the last hour. And most importantly, thanks to everybody for coming to this event. Have a safe journey. Um, 